Hello everyone and welcome back to The Road to 2000. As always, my name is Caleb Denby and tonight I have a pretty fun topic for you. It's going to be a more instruct uh, instructive night than last week. We are going to be talking about the difference between Grandmaster level players and players around my strength, maybe even a little, little stronger. Um, I find these games really, really interesting to look at because in these Grandmaster versus Grandmaster games, a lot of times the, the play is at such a high level, they're making all kinds of decisions that uh, a player like me and a player like you might not really run across. Whereas it's super instructive to see how players at your level or even a little bit above um, lose games consistently. Because Grandmasters, of course, consistently beat players like me. That's just the way it is uh, over the board. And so we're going to look at these games and we're going to see if there's anything we can take away uh, to work on in uh, my chess and your chess to be able to compete with these super strong players a little bit better. So let's switch over to this. Hopefully everything is up and running. And I actually want to start with this game uh, between, of course, one of the top US players, Var Akobian and a player by the name of uh, Kazim uh, Gulamali. Now, you've probably never heard of Varakobian's opponent here because uh, I don't believe he's that strong of a chess player. He's around, uh, I think, the 2200 feet A mark, uh, which of course is still very, very good, but you know nothing to Varakobian. So to uh, probably most of the viewers and uh, even to myself, it's hard to imagine a 2200 feet A player uh, kind of going down without a fight or really consistently uh, losing to to anybody. But that's what we're going to see here uh, between uh, Gulamali and Akobian. So let's try and figure out how it happens. Uh, Gulamali starts with e4, and now we get d6. Um, and so Var already has adopted a pretty interesting uh, approach in the form of the Pirates. Uh, now, uh, his opponent goes d4, and we actually see knight f6, the main line so far. And rather than the super main line with knight to c3, Gulamali actually shows this move uh, pawn to f3, which is perfectly acceptable, but it is uh, more of a sideline than knight c3. Perhaps a little bit more conservative, defending the e4 pawn with the f3 pawn, pretty much saying to black, no, I, I don't want to ever launch this pawn out to f4 and go for some of those more active uh, lines against the Pirates. And now VAR is going to make a really interesting decision here. So sort of the quote unquote normal way to play would be to strike back in the center now with the move e5. You can also uh, think about fianchettoing this bishop or think about challenging the center with the pawn, uh, with the c pawn going pawn c5 to hit d4, but Var actually plays this move d5, which is, of course, a little bit more off the beaten path. It's not often you see this little stutter step by the d pawn, losing a little bit, bit of time early in the opening. Uh, here, I think Var can get away with it because, you know, like Ben Feingold says, you should never play f3. And uh, while it is a useful uh, supporting move for this pawn on e4, we're going to see that VAR is able to waste just a little bit of time because white can't get active quite as quickly because this pawn on f3 is sort of hindering white's own development. This knight is going to struggle to find a good square with this pawn on f3 taking away its most natural developing square. Now that being said, after d5, uh, how do you think white should react, chat room? What should uh, white try to go for? What should we go for here? So yeah, Gabriel has the right idea, and I think it's the most intuitive move. Uh, Ray actually suggests the move played in the game, which is e takes d5. And this move is okay, but generally, you know, you, you have the ability to take space in the opening, and uh, when you get that ability, you generally should take it. Uh, sometimes you'll see both players sort of dancing around the center, not 
fully committing to a ton of space. But here e5 is just, I think, the best idea. You, you kick Black's Knight around, and you also get to make this beautiful pawn center, uh, hampering Black's pieces. Um, and, you know, be it a psychological thing, or maybe just Gulamali preferred the position after e takes d5, we do get e takes d5 instead of e5. And that's the first thing I kind of want to talk about, is at all levels of chess, uh, I think people tend to play a little bit differently when they're playing a uh, player who's higher rated than them, who's better than them at chess, uh, versus someone who's a little bit lower rated than them, or even at the same string. Uh, and there seems to be a tendency to want to simplify things, uh, go for something you know easier that you think you can understand just as well. And I'm of the mindset that uh, it's better just, just to play your best chess. So do what you think is best, and if you end up losing because it's complicated, then you at least, hopefully, you've learned something from it. So I'm not a huge fan of E takes D5. I feel like it is unnecessarily trying to simplify things, and it definitely is kind of giving away the advantage that Var had offered up. Like E5 is definitely a fight for an advantage, whereas this move now, uh, we're going to see that white doesn't quite get that central dominance that we would have seen with e5. That being said, uh, white does have some good ideas here. This knight has been drawn out to the d5 square, so we're going to see c4 in an effort to push it away. Now knight b6 and knight c3 is all fairly normal so far. So if you are var Akobian and you are sort of the, the favorite here by 300 plus points, uh, what do you want to do now? to uh, fight back in this opening and give yourself some chances to uh, to win this game, perhaps. We need a good idea for black here. Something strong. Something strong. And the chat room is correct once again with the exact same idea that uh, we saw for the other site a few moves ago. It's kind of funny. I, I asked the chat room two questions, and the answer both times, it of course, was the move e5. Now, I'm surprised kind of that the chat came up with this so quickly, because this is a pure pawn sacrifice. You are not going to be getting this pawn back anytime soon. But uh, VAR doesn't care here, uh, because VAR understands sort of the weakness that white has created by playing this move f3 so early on. Uh, by, by playing this move, the huge uh, problem that white is going to run into here isn't necessarily that, uh, you know, that, that it weakens squares, which it does. Uh, in this case, the problem is that white has to waste a lot of time now to get the pieces totally developed. And we're going to see that after white accepts this pawn sacrifice, which Playing something like d5 would sort of just feel a little bit bad here. You don't really have great control over these dark squares on the queen's side, and uh, black now has a, a nice pawn in the center as well. So don't really like the move d5. That's why we say d takes e5 instead. Var is not unhappy to trade, uh, trade the queens here. We see knight takes d1, trying to preserve the king's uh, castling rights in this case. And now Var simply plays knight c6, hitting this pawn on e5. Uh, there's really only one comfortable way to defend it, and that is with the move f4. And now we see bishop e6. So already out of the opening, uh, Var has managed to create uh, some intrigue, uh, is one way to put it. Meaning, Var has in fact sacrificed a full pawn here, but in return, he has three full pieces developed, and white has all of their pieces on the back row. So we're going to see now that uh, once an imbalance has been created, uh, generally the GMs are just going to find the better way to navigate the complications. And in this case, I think it's simply a, a matter of opening understanding. VAR had prepared this opening. I'm fairly confident he didn't just come up with this uh, totally on the fly. Uh, and this position has been reached before in the database. And I'm reasonably certain that Gulamali uh, had a lot less prep and a lot less knowledge going into this game. Uh, Ray says bishop f5 was better. I have to disagree because this move is actually coming with tempo. Actually coming with tempo. 
So here already, uh, on move 10, we're going to see white start to make mistakes. So it might not seem like white is in all that much danger uh, in the position because queens have been traded off the board. White is up for the moment a healthy pawn, and you don't immediately see how black is creating too many threats. But with that being said, it turns out that time very much is of the essence here, and white needs to play pretty accurately to not be worse out of this opening. So Ray suggests b3 for white, but this is actually the mistake played in the game. Uh, b3 is not going to be a great move here for white. And the reason is uh, it's simply a little bit too slow. I mean, you're already down three pieces in development. And after queen side castles by black, black's king is out of the center and the rook is already on an active open file. And you're just sort of falling further and further behind in development. Um, so what's a much better move than b3 for white? There is something a lot better. Something better here than b3. What's to do, chat room? What to do? And yeah, Kyle has the right idea. It's simply knight e3 here. And the point is, yes, we are defending our pawn, but we're also getting developed. Um, and here, queenside castles is perfectly reasonable for black. Bishop c5 would also be a move to keep up the pressure. And then I think for white, it's honestly just best to sacrifice this pawn back. You don't need to go all in trying to maintain your extra pawn. Uh, something like this is perfectly reasonable just leveling the playing field in terms of development, keeping your space advantage in the center, uh, and giving back the pawn. And I think this is something that GMs are a lot better at doing than you know a 2200 level player, 2200 feet A. Um, and I think it's really, really pivotal to these kinds of games. You know, I know for myself in particular, once you have one kind of advantage, uh, you tend to want to just uh, like stick with that right like you're like and this is my extra pawn this is what i'm gonna try to hold on to to try to win this game and this fluidity is actually really really important uh at the higher levels of chess you need to be willing to give back uh, a material advantage to get your pieces developed or give up your extra development in return for some material uh in some cases and so here we see that VAR has just navigated those complications a bit better than, uh, than white has. White going for b3. Now the game definitely isn't over, but after queen side castles, I think black is definitely on the offensive at this point. Uh, white does continue with the move knight e3, and simply bishop c5. VAR completes development, no need to do anything too crazy uh, just yet. And now, chat room, I would like you to find a move for white, white to move here. And I uh, suspect that not many people are going to come up with the move that uh, that was played by white in the game, because it just doesn't make too much sense. Chat room says, is it just me or is it super laggy? I sure hope not. Uh, everything looks good on my end for the moment, might be on your end, but I don't know. Ray says a5, that seems highly illegal. Pawns can't move that far, I promise. They don't go that far. One square at a time, two squares if it's your first turn. It is not black to play, white to play. Bishop b2 or king f3, I assume you mean king f2, or maybe you mean knight f3. Knight b4 on the horizon for black. Mm -mm. Streaming for new location, yeah, I am upstairs in, at, the, uh, at the chess club today. Knight e2 has been suggested. So yeah, you guys are along the right track here. Um, you need to develop your pieces. And I think, you know, looking back, that's probably a really, really simple idea. 
is like, yeah, okay, I mean, I have to develop my pieces here, but moves like bishop e2, moves like knight f3, uh, these, you know, it's sort of getting desperate for white here. You, you need to play these moves before it's too late. Uh, but I think some psychology came into play here again. Uh, Kyle mentioned this idea of knight b4 and was a little bit afraid of this plan involving maybe captures on e3, and something like knight c2 check. And so white, seeing this coming, plays the move a3. And this move is, is simply too much. It's just too much. You can't have one, two, three, four, five pieces developed in uncastled king and play the move, play the move a3. You, you just cannot do it. There's no pawn in the world that's going to be enough compensation here if you continue wasting tempi. Um, and after this, black is simply just winning out of the opening. So a move like knight f3 would have kept the game going. A move like bishop e2 also would have kept the game going. But uh, we do need to find a response to this idea of knight to b4. So what do you think our response should be? What should our response be to this knight b4 idea? Not the easiest problem to solve. Definitely not the easiest. King f1, rook b1. These moves are all very slow. They're very, very slow. Um, and I don't want to spoil why they're the worst moves just yet, but they are a bit too slow to be any good. And we'll look at why in a little bit here. So Gabriel has the right idea. Once again, it's going to be uh, flexibility. That's the key in this game. And that's what white was just missing. White has the extra pawn, wanted to keep the extra pawn, and wanted to uh, you know, sort of play to keep this. And if white keeps this, then maybe white is a lot better. But that's just not how chess works, right? The, p the pawn wasn't actually free. Black got a lot of development in exchange for it. And so if you're not willing to give it back to finish your own development, then you, you might end up significantly worse. So knight f3 is actually the best move. And then after bishop takes e3, we simply play bishop takes e3 and king f2. And white is not at all worse in this position. In fact, white would be quite a bit better with the two bishops and the powerful pawn center uh, in this instance. This knight on b6 is simply useless. Uh, these bishops are going to be strong. c5 is on the horizon as well as these kingside pushes. Knight g5 is also going to be a good move. And white is just significantly better here after the exchange sacrifice. Uh, now what's wrong with rook b1? Well, let's take a look at what happens in the game first. Rather than develop, we see white play this move a3. So this is where white makes the mistake, and then one mistake is oftentimes uh, enough to, to lose the game against a player like Barakovian. So how do we punish white's mistake? Is it time for tactics, or is it time to, uh, to keep it going? Exchange stack doesn't work here. Run it through an engine. Believe it or not, Ray, I do occasionally prep for my classes. And that position was about plus one for white, according to Stockfish13. Um, so you're welcome to, to check for yourself on that one. But that one, pretty good for white. OK, we've got some ideas. Knight d4, knight a5, both being suggested. Bishop d4 has been suggested. And yeah, these moves are probably all uh, reasonable for black, but I like what VAR did, does kind of best. There's actually a more tactical uh, knockout blow here. So white was better until that point? No, white wasn't better. Black, of course, should not capture the exchange and continue playing for uh, development. The point being is that white needed to get developed in this position and that was White's chance to keep the game in the balance. And then 
it was actually a bit of a trap for black. If black gets too greedy and tries to take the exchange, then white's going to end up better. Black has to keep the dynamics flowing. So Matthew actually has the tactical way to uh, seize a huge advantage with the move f6. But Var, being a professional here, says, I'm going to develop my rook first and plays the move rook h to e8. And these f6 rook e8 ideas are uh, how black is breaking through in this position. Uh, you may have spent a tempi stopping knight b4, but var is going to continue multi-purpose moves, developing and creating threats at the same time. And there's only so long you can uh, survive on the back row once black has all the pieces in the game. Uh, we see knight f3 by white, and of course now the idea is f6, and white is simply busted here. Uh, e takes f6 was tried in the game, and what's the winning move in this position chat room? What's the winning move here? Black to move and win. No uh, crazy tactics here. It's just uh, it's it's just sad. It's just sad for, for white. Oh, and I've started fights in the chat room once again. It's so sad. It's so sad. Bishop takes pawn. Not quite. Why sacrifice a piece when you can simply retreat it? Keep the piece and still have the same tactic. So bishop g8 is var's move, and this one is going to be enough to win the game. Um, there's simply no good way to defend this knight. You have two options, and both of them remain in pretty nasty pins. White picked the weird king e2, but king f2 honestly wouldn't have made much of a difference here. After king e2, var simply takes back on f6, taking his time. White pretends that someday he's going to develop, and then the last move of the game is actually the very clever move, knight to a5. Uh, the point now being that if you try to play b4, I take on e3, take on e3, take on c4, and this pawn, or er, this bishop dies. And if you try to defend the pawn, I can simply capture and win material uh, like this. So basically, white's whole queen side is completely falling apart, and the center is completely falling apart, and white never even gets developed in this game. So this is the first type of win I wanted to show you between a grandmaster and, you know, a, a master level player. Uh, and this is sort of the saddest kind of game you're going to find, where white just never really got off the ground. You know what I mean? White uh, was a little bit too rigid in the opening. White's, you know, got this extra pawn and then wasn't willing to adapt to the situation. And that is a skill that is very, very hard to develop, and that's why uh, GMs are so much better at it than, uh, than master level players. It's just so tough to know when you should sort of hold on to what you've got and when you need to throw it all away to get your pieces out. Uh, would bishop g4 work instead of bishop g8? Probably. I think there are a lot of winning moves here for uh, black. I think why var didn't do it is perhaps concerns over this move f7. Probably var wants to keep uh, the f7 square defended, so we don't have to make a decision with this rook. Uh, bishop f7 I'm sure is also fine, but maybe var was looking to avoid knight g5 with tempo. Just bishop g8 is the simplest. You get the bishop out of the way, and the, the tactics speak for themselves. Mm -mm. The way this game played out, it's like, is white really a master? So, so yeah, it's very different when you're sitting across the board from you know a 2200 feet a player it's very very different than than this game it goes to show just how strong these grandmasters actually are uh, they understand the nuances of their positions they understand when they need to be flexible they understand how to navigate imbalances and so that's the first type of game i wanted to show um before i move on are there any questions here because there seem to be doubts over uh over this position so uh, I guess I should address what should black do here if not knight b4 going for this knight c2 stuff. Well, it turns out black is still going to be a lot better here by attacking the center, staying true to the original plan, not getting sidetracked with spending four tempi winning, winning an exchange 
when White's going to use those four tempi to develop the rest of their pieces. Um, so hopefully that answers some of those questions. Uh, with that out of the way, let's move on to another U.S. chess legend. Um, are, can you be a legend if you're still like you know playing and having a career? I don't know. Uh, I'll call him legends for now. U.S. champion Sam Shankland with the black pieces here, uh, up against Rentala Nagrenda, uh, who is 2265, another 22, 2300 level player, up against just an absolute monster. Where was White's last chance to keep fighting and stay in the game? So uh, I'll just briefly step back here. Looking from White's perspective, a3 is when the game really goes in the dumpster. If you play something like knight f3 here, you're still in the game. Uh, I think black is probably a little bit better uh, because of just the sheer amounts of develop development. White is going to have to give some stuff back eventually. But if you get the pieces developed, you get the king to f2, you get the rooks in the center, then you do have a, a fair shot at, at this game. You just have to absolutely develop as quickly as possible. After a3, though, pretty much busted. All right, let's move on. We're looking at uh, Rentala versus Sam Shankland. We get a Sicilian and Rentala plays b3. So once again, uh, I understand being afraid of the you know prep of a player like Sam Shankland, but I think it is uh, a bit better to just play what you are comfortable with. And maybe for Rentala, this is b3. But to my eyes, b3 looks like a sideline that you kind of pull out when you want things to be a little bit calmer. But maybe I've got it all wrong. I don't know that for a fact. But anyways, we get b3 and Sam plays e6. Um, once again, far off the beaten path already by move 2. Bishop b2, now b6, and we are very, very far off the beaten path now with Sam fianchettling this bishop and just adopting a very simple, very solid setup in the center. Uh, knight c3, bishop b7, and both sides do actually manage to complete development this game. So already a step up from the previous example. And here we see white going for pretty standard ideas in 1b3 type openings. In this case, b3 wasn't played until move 2, but white is sort of staying true to the b3 idea. You uh, occasionally try to get rid of this bishop for this knight and play for control over the dark squares, activating this bishop on b2. I, I taught a whole lecture on this plan uh, way back in the day for those long-term fans. So my question to you now is, as Sam Shankland, what are you going to do against this move, bishop to b5? Uh, continue developing, or is there something else you can do? As you see me, I'm actually sitting by a window here. And there were uh, some protests going on earlier today, and I think uh, someone just drove by. That was part of it. Oh, all the positivity in the chat. All the positivity. Bishop e7, knight f6, d5. Well. First of all, you want to be a little bit careful playing bishop b7. Um, whenever you leave this pawn undefended, it does just get a little bit scary, although it's probably perfectly fine here. Um, but I do like Praneet's idea uh, a lot better. It's really, really useful uh, at all levels of chess to understand what your opponent's plan is, what they are you know, trying to do, and if you can sort of steer the game in a direction where they are not able to do that, that can be very, very useful. Uh, we saw VAR kind of do it just by, you know, playing a very, very offbeat opening. In this game, we see Sam doing that with the move knight to d4. I think this is very much an attempt to get white out of this plan that uh, they're probably comfortable with, right? Uh, because if you just play a simple move like knight f6, uh, let's say we get like castles, bishop e7, um, even like d3 or something, a6, something like this. I think this is sort of what white is more fam uh, more familiar with in the b3 plan. So you play for the dark squares, you give up the bishop for the knight, and you try to find an advantage like this. Uh, whereas with the move knight d4, all of a sudden, uh, white is going to have to adapt that plan entirely. Uh, no longer are you getting rid of this knight, and in fact, if you ever take on d4, 
it's going to be black with control over the dark squares in the center. So already, uh, Sam is doing some things to get the opponent a little bit off balance. Uh, we see castles by white, knight f6 by black, applying a little bit of pressure. This bishop comes on back to d3 to defend the e4 pawn. Bishop e7 now, and rook e1, castles, and now knight takes d4 by white. So already you see that uh, black is actually going to be a little bit better out of the opening. But I want to stress that this is a very different uh you know, method of getting an advantage than what we saw in VAR's game. In VAR's game, VAR very much took a, you know, riskier approach. He went for a very imbalanced position and uh, kept putting on the pressure until the opponent kind of cracked. In this case, the mistakes are coming from White seemingly unprovoked by Sam Shanklin. And I think this is actually the more common way you see GMs uh, beating players of this strength. Uh, there's... Uh, a good rule in chess, and that rule is that, you know, your opponent can't make any mistakes if you're forcing them to play sort of only moves. So sometimes by creating more threats and by keeping up, you know, all this pressure, 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 you're actually making your opponent's job very, very easy. They simply have to find the only move that is reasonable, and when they do, then they're still okay. Whereas in a position like this, Sam has given his opponent a lot of options here. White could think about playing for e5. White could think about rerouting this knight and playing something like c3, d4. White could even, I don't know, potentially do something on the queen side. Or white could capture in the center. And the fact of the matter is, when you're a grandmaster with more experience in these positions, you're going to be able to know, you know which of these options are good and which of these options are bad. And players at the 2200 level, they're simply not going to be as good at making these kinds of open-ended decisions. So, what am I trying to say? I'm saying GMs uh, are the scariest when it seems like you have a lot of options. Because then, you have to actually decide for yourself. And in this case, white decides somewhat wrong here with C ta or knight takes d4. Uh, black is simply going to be better after c takes d4. Because, number one, we hit this knight with tempo, and after knight b5, we can shore up our central position here with the pawn on e5. Now, I want to flip, flip the script a little bit. We're going to look from White's point of view, and I'm going to ask you uh, a, a kind of loaded question. So, as White, what are you afraid of in this position? What are you afraid of here? Your opponent just played e5. You're playing Sam Shankland, who at the time of this game was not U.S. champion, but uh, was a future U.S. champion at the time of this game. Uh, what are you afraid of? What do you think Sam's up to here? So yeah, Dashun has a, a good idea here. Um, you're afraid of the b7 bishop, so yeah, th this is what we're sort of arriving at. Black is making a pretty serious threat in this position, uh, and that threat is to play the move d5, uh, as Kyle and Dashun said in the chat, activating along these light squares and sort of breaking open the position. So white, black is playing d5, or, or at least this is one of black's ideas. So what should we do about it? How do we deal with this threat uh, of pawn d5? White knight b5 isn't knight e2 better? Knight b5 is, is actually a pretty reasonable idea here for uh, reasons that we shall soon see. Also, uh, knight e2 is maybe okay, but you do have to realize you're temporarily interfering with your control over the e4 square. So maybe it's okay because you're counterattacking here and you play knight g3 right away but uh, something to think about there with the, the pawn on e4 as well. So yeah, I've successfully led the chat room to, to say the wrong move. Thank you all for, for playing along. I know you all realized that c4 is probably a bad move, uh, but thank you for playing along with my line of questioning. So c4 was played in the game, and you don't need to be an armchair psychologist to know why this move was played. 
Uh, Rintala was just simply afraid of d5. And why wouldn't you be? Sam is threatening to activate everything. Like, let's say you play some slow move like h3. Black is just going to break out with d5. If you take this piece, queen takes d5, and you're already, like, you, you're so busted here. You are getting so busted uh, on the king's side. You have to play, like, f3 or something awful. Bishop f1 is leading to these pawns rolling down the board. And it's just, it's just so, so sad. Um, if I flip on the engine here, let's see. It's only, no wait, it's like equal. Wait, this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. Okay, okay, I can do better. I can do better. I can do better. A3, putting this knight on a bad square. And then D5. I was like, yeah, wait a second. Isn't bishop f1 fine? But after we kick this knight away, yeah. So this is the line I was talking about where black is rolling down the center. You just have to get rid of this knight first. To defend your d4 pawn and so of course now this actually does look bad uh i'm not just scamming you glad i checked so d5 very very scary if you play a slow move like h3 you could just be losing right away uh so high weed suggests queen f3 this is uh, another reasonable idea but you're still gonna get sort of busted by this move d5 i think this bishop is gonna come through now onto the e4 square hitting this queen with tempo and uh, I don't know how long for this world uh, your position's going to be. Uh, okay, again, we should probably include this. But uh, once again, e4 breaking through, and Sam is just taking over the entire center. So, you know, when you're sitting there and you're calculating with the white pieces, and you're like, oh, I'd like to play queen f3, but okay, no, it looks like it loses. Uh, maybe I can play something slow like h3. No, that, that also just loses. Um, you start to sort of convince yourself that c4 is your only option. Uh, but, chat room, why is c4 bad? Uh, and also, what should we do differently? So let's answer that question first. What should we do other than c4? Something more active. More active. Dashun has a suggestion, suggestion with f4. Anything else? that we could try. What else could we try here to activate the pieces? OK, now everybody wants to play F4. So Kyle has the move that I was fishing for. F4 is actually also a really nice uh, idea, but uh, the move C3 is a little bit more to my liking, just just because, you know, what I hate moving my F pawn. I just hate it. You know, I play F3 in like every opening, but sometimes I hate moving my F pawn as well. Just weakens a lot of squares. So C3, I think, is the best idea here for white, although F4 is another very viable way to, you know, try and challenge the center. Um, so just for example, c3, let's say black does play this move a6, and go d5. Uh, what was our point? What's the big idea here? What's the big idea? Knight takes d4, that would be a little bit much. That would be losing a piece. Ah, uh, hello Dave! Yes! Dave, the first person in the chat to point out that uh, I cut all my hair off. This is my first haircut uh, class. So of course we need to fight back in the center here. In all the other lines, we were having to sort of deal with this threat to the e4 pawn by capturing, and that was activating our opponent's pieces in this case, we are simply fighting back in the center using our C pawn. So yeah, C takes D4, and when the dust settles, uh, white is going to be perfectly okay here. We see this nice bishop against this knight, but really both sides are going to have some activity here, and potentially this D3 pawn is more of a weakness than an asset. For example, knight C4 heading to E5, and white is going to be able to activate uh, comfortably here. Um, and it's not quite a quality. Black is going to be a little bit better with this super strong bishop, but, you know, white is still in the game. White finds activity. Um, 
So c3, I think, was the best idea for white here. Instead, we see the move c4. So I, I've sort of said, you know, just and because you guys trust me, you believe me, that um, this is a bad move. Uh, but let's try and understand why c4 is so bad. Uh, what should black be doing to, uh, to take advantage of this move c4? What should black be doing? And apparently I have some YouTube celebrity in my chat. I get the feeling it's probably not the real account. If I had to guess, generally there's a check mark by these people's names when they are the real ones. Um, Vishwash, I think in that line, if you go queen takes d3, I still take on f6, and then you actually have trouble uh, recapturing because don't control that square quite enough time, so you have to fracture your pawns. So Derek says lock down the position to kill the light squared bishop. And that's sort of the trick of it. Um, you don't really have to do anything to lock down the bishop and kill the light squared bishop. White sort of did that for you. And not only did white kill the light squared bishop, white also kind of killed the dark squared bishop with this move. So that's why c4 is so bad. It just becomes very, very difficult for white to activate the pieces. And I mean, it's not a totally lost cause. You can imagine f4 someday trying to rip things open or this bishop finding a new diagonal somewhere. But the fact of the matter is it's going to take white a long, long time to activate these pieces. And in the meantime, black is going to come up with an active plan. So to start with, uh, perhaps anticipating f4 ideas, and just because it gives you a little bit more space in general, we do see black play this move d6. And then after knight a3, we need to launch an active idea. So what can we do with the black pieces here to take advantage of white's inactivity? What's our game plan in the long run? What's our game plan here? What to do? So yeah, Great Wolf is mentioning that uh, he was perhaps relying on the f4 break to activate this bishop, and that's part of the problem with uh, white's position, is this pawn on d6 is actually very, very useful for black, because after f4, black of course isn't going to take on f4, uh, they're just going to let the, the pawn sit. And then if you take, simply pawn takes e5 again, and you're in the exact same predicament as before. Mm. So you guys are along the right track, and I think Harry Gates is the first one to find the uh, sort of exact way that uh, Black went about it. In this case, Knight h5 would, as Ben Feingold puts it, be risky. So Knight d7 instead is the better idea. And we're not really pushing g5 first, but we are looking to push f5. Of course, activating this bishop along this long diagonal, again, reviving our plans of pushing our central pawns and overwhelming the white position, uh, and, and just attacking on the king's side. And Pyman also has the, the right idea in building it up a little bit first. We're not going to play it right away, but we are looking to play it. Uh, white plays this move, bishop back to f1, while well they can, since this pawn is defended. And now simply knight c5, activates the knight further, we see pawn to d3, and white play, or black plays another preparatory move in the form of queen d7 before launching into this f5 idea. Just improving the pieces, and even visually, you can see that black should just be much better here. Without doing any kind of calculating or even like finding the plans, you see a strong knight on c5, you see this bishop and queen, both with open ideas, and you see white's pieces just sort of scattered around the board and kind of aimless, if I had to describe them in a word. 
Uh, white tries the move g3 here, which is uh, as good a try as any to activate the bishop this way. And now Sam Shanklin simply plays the move f5. Uh, and this is just going to be tough for white now. White is already, I would say, lost positionally. Bishop h3 was white's idea, and he sticks with it. Um, but now we actually see black rerouting again with this move knight e6 and uh, sort of daring white to actually capture this pawn on f5. Of course, black has some ideas here in the form of just giving up this rook, playing knight g5, and with these powerful pieces on the light squares, white is, like, checkmated, basically. <laughs> uh, basically just, just checkmated here. We're not even going to play knight f3 to take the rook on e1. We're going to play knight f3 and then bring the queen in and then you know deliver checkmate to the white king. Um, so bishop takes f5 is simply unplayable. Bishop c1 was played instead. Um, Rantala showing a little bit of chess strength here is like, yeah, no, I'm not playing bishop f5. Sam Shanklin is just going to murder me in this position. Uh, but now simply takes on e4, takes on e4. Black has a target, an open f file, and an active way to bring in all the pieces. So rook f6, why not bring in another rook? We get rook g6, and now rook f8. And now knight c2, and Sam simply unpins to bring in the final pieces. Uh, we get knight b4. Finally, this knight has completed its journey and is heading for the powerful d5 square. It only took one, two, three, four, five, and going to be six moves. Uh, so we get bishop g5, and now knight d5. And how do we convert this as Sam Shanklin? How do we convert this? How to convert this position? So Sam actually picks a pretty simple way to convert here. Now that the knight has spent six moves getting to d5, you might as well take it. Um, Sam first takes on d2 though, we get take on e6, take on e6, take on d2, and then simply bishop takes d5. And that goes to show you how bad white's position really is, right? You spend six moves getting the knight to a good square, and then it just gets captured by a bishop that moved twice. Um, and this is just the end of the game. Uh, we see e takes d5, queen h3, and now white doesn't have enough space on the king side to deal with these problems. By the way, black also has a protected pass pawn in the form of d4. And there's just no recovering at this point. Rook e4 was played. Rook h6 was played, which isn't even the best, but it's good enough. Um, f4 is the only way to defend the h2 pawn. So simply captures. And now, uh, once again, you, you cannot take this guy back. If you take with the rook, I'll take back. And if you take with the pawn, then you get checked and checkmated. Same with the rook. You can't take with the queen, of course, because of checkmate. And here it's the same issue. Um, so can't capture this pawn back. White plays queen g2. Simply f takes g now. And we see the queens are still on the board. And black is just up material now. And white is still checkmated. Uh, we do get to see a nice finish after h5. Rook takes d4. We get queen c1 check. Rook e1. And what's the last move of the game, chat room? Black to move and win here. Black to move and win. This move is so good that Rentala had to resign. Ah, uh, yeah, this is an excellent point. Uh, we do have connect four for white. Yes, so the chat room sees it. It's rook f1 and checkmate to follow or at least a few extra pieces a few extra pieces for black so after rook f1 check uh, white simply resigned this game so what happened here well what happened is sam did the very very mean thing of giving his opponent some options right a little bit of pressure in the form of threatening to play d5 but really at this point white sort of sealed his own fate by playing knight takes d4 now black is already a little bit better and you absolutely have to play for activity as quickly as you can 
you can't be afraid play the pawn the, the move pawn c4 like this you just get crushed by sam shanklin so in short what's the difference between gms and master level players well gms are better at chess <laughs> um uh, but really, it's about this kind of flexibility that GMs have, and it's about having the confidence to be flexible, having the confidence to trade one type of position for another, and just trusting that uh, you know what you're doing. Uh, you have to have a little bit of confidence in yourself in order to play chess like this, because if you're second-guessing, if, you know, if I should just be, be keeping with what I know, then more often than not, you're going to be making concessions to keep the game in, in, to, in something that you're comfortable with. You have to be willing to be flexible, and that's what these two players just were not able to do. Now, I want to highlight one more game uh, before we leave here, and we're not going to spend too long on it just because we don't have that much time. Oops, spoilers, you didn't see anything. Um, and it's going to be this game between Alejandro Ramirez, uh, another American chess uh, living legend, as they say, and Oscar Maldonado, who is also around 2,200 feet in. And I wanted to include this game because uh, if you ask a grandmaster, what should I study to get better at chess? Uh, a lot of the time, the answer is end games. And this game really is going to highlight the importance of having a good end game understanding. And that's something that I think grandmasters just blow master level players out of the water with their understanding of rook end games in particular is just at such a different level that it really uh, helps you make decisions in middle games. So let's see how Alejandro uses his rook end game knowledge here in order to win this game against Oscar. Uh, we have um, a fairly normal opening. We get a King's Indian, uh, kind of a check pierk uh, type of setup with the pawn on c6, although the pawn's not on e4 yet castles, and then we actually see d d5 from Oscar Maldonado. So Maldonado going for a, a bit more sim, uh, simplistic structure, structures, exchange slob type stuff after c takes d5 and c takes d5. In the game we see Alejandro go knight e5, e6, bishop f4, which is getting developed, and black is eager to trade off some pieces, trying to negate this powerful knight on e5. We see takes and takes, now bishop b5, takes and takes, now knight c6, and f4 by white, and here I want to ask you guys at home, uh, let's flip the board, why don't we? And you guys at home, how do you feel about Black's position right now? How do you feel about it? That's my question to you. Do you feel good? Do you feel bad? Do you feel okay? We don't know. How do we feel? Very cramped, bad. Fair enough. So everybody feels bad about this position. It's not as bad as you might expect, though. It's not as bad. <laughs> not the worst, as Super Marco puts it. Um, and I tend to agree here. So obviously this bishop is going to be the problem for black. But the good news is this isn't an unsolvable problem. You can imagine a future when this bishop lands on the c6 square. If black is able to play magically bishop d7, bishop c6, and these two pieces like go elsewhere, then black is going to be perfectly fine here. Now why is black going to be fine? because the structure is very, very solid. Black doesn't really have any major weaknesses yet. So if we can just achieve this one little maneuver by black, then we should be good to go. Uh, so what I want you to pay attention to is what Alejandro plays to try and make sure this doesn't become a reality. Uh, first, we start with knight e7. I think black plays this move to try and stop knight b5 to d6. Maybe it's a bit better to bring the rook into the game, but knight e7 is fine. Queen d2. And now queen c7. So already, um, black is threatening to go bishop d7 and bishop c6. So chat room, what should we try to do to stop it? What should we try to do to stop it here?
So the chat room has the right idea once again. Um, right now, white's only advantage in... Okay, I might be exaggerating a little bit, but really white's only real advantage is the fact that this bishop has not yet planted itself onto c6. If you give black two tempi, I think this is dead equal. Yeah, dead equal, even stockfish agrees with me. Um, no reason at all black should be worse here. So how do you try to take advantage of this undeveloped bishop? Well, of course, you need to open things up in the center. So Alejandro understands this. He plays the move e4 and is hoping to open up this diagonal and find counterplay over here before black finishes development. Um, to his credit, uh, Oscar does play pretty well for the next few moves. Brings the rook to d8. We see a check and now king to g7 and now queen f2. So chats, how should black play to survive this? There's really only one option that I think keeps black realistically in the game. What can we do? And quickly, we're running out of time. So time's up chat room. Of course, we need to develop our bishop and get it out to c6. So bishop d7, in this case, I think is the only real way black can stay in the game. And in this case, it's actually going to be a, a pawn sacrifice. We see queen b6, a b6, bishop b7, rook a7, bishop f3. We're actually just going to play bishop c6, getting this bishop activated at all costs. You can imagine, uh, take, take, and something like rook f2. And black is going to be worse here, but I don't think black is by any means losing. There's a lot, a lot of work left to do here with white because we have this active A file and we have control over this D file for the moment as, as well. So black is going to be able to get some counterplay, you know, bring these pieces in, play something like B5, B4, cement this pawn in A2 as a weakness, and uh, black is by no means out of this game uh, if black plays bishop D7. Now, once again, though, it takes a lot of guts and a lot of chess understanding to play a move like bishop d7. And I think that's understanding that Oscar maybe did not fully have, or at least not the confidence to go through with it. Instead, Oscar trades the queens, and now it's not too late to play bishop d7, but the open b file is actually a lot less good than the open a file, and white is already sort of a tempo up on the other line with this rook on f2 ready to swing over and double up. So... At this point, black tries a5 and tries his best to untangle, but it's just not going to happen. Uh, we see knight d5, rook d1, b6, king g1, bishop b7, and this is where rook endgame understanding really comes into play. So up to this point, white has been playing just good solid chess, you know, using this advantage in development and trying to turn it into something, uh, and right now it's an advantage in activity. But it can be difficult to convert these kinds of uh, th these kinds of positions, right? Because you know, at any moment, given a couple tempi, Black is going to be able to sort of resurrect this position, get the pieces in the game. Like Bishop A8, Knight takes F6 is on the cards. Uh, but in this case, Alejandro can calculate out what happens if I just trade everything and try to win the rook end game. And it turns out that's exactly what happens in this position. We take everything, Alejandro plays e6, and after rook e8, we see takes, rook, e, rook d7, and takes. And this is where having good knowledge of rook endgames is sort of invaluable, right? A player like me, I look at this position, I'm like, oh, white's up a pawn, that seems pretty good. But if you, you know, really put the question to me, and we're like, is white winning in this position? I wouldn't be able to give you uh, uh, an answer. And by having such a good understanding of rook endgames, uh, like GMs often do, uh, you are able to evaluate these kinds of decisions so much more quickly and so much more easily. And whenever you find an out to a winning endgame, you can jump at that opportunity, prevent any other complications, and sort of secure yourself uh, a full point. So that's what Alejandro does here. Um, quickly, I will show you the winning technique. He simply brings his king in, has the active rook, and pushes his f-pawn until it becomes uh, a queen. Just pushes it right up the board, and black resigns. Now, in fairness, I'm not sure why black thought it was a good idea to bring the king over to b7 
and leave this past F pawn. But the, from my analysis, it, it looks like this end game is just dead, dead lost, anyways. Um, so there you have it. Uh, quite a few reasons why. Um, sorry. Uh, no, we're good. Okay, quite a few reasons why and uh, why grandmasters are so much stronger than master level players. From stuff like just being able to uh, be flexible, stuff like having more confidence in your uh, decision making abilities, and then of course just technical knowledge does play quite a significant factor. Uh, let me know what you thought of this lecture. I had a blast going over these games. I think they were all from the 2013 World Open. I love watching these kinds of tournaments where GMs take on slightly weaker opponents just to see that uh, GM level technique.